Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. An angry husband, worse than an angry dog? Today's story with a similar plot. Enjoy it! In my home, in a cozy corner, in front of a large screen, I'm enjoying the moment, having two cold beers and some snacks in the mini-fridge near my comfortable chair. Suddenly, a phone call interrupts. I dream it's not an endless stream of telemarketing calls. It was around 8 in the evening on Wednesday. My wife, Tracy, usually worked late on Wednesdays, and I was hoping for a peaceful and pleasant evening. Today was special. I ordered pizza from Papa John's, grabbed a couple of beers, and enjoyed watching the Cubs game, planning to relax. Next to me in the fridge were two more bottles, and in the kitchen, there were six more. The evening seemed promising. My wife returned around 10 o'clock, quickly took a shower, and by 11 o'clock, we were already going to bed. Wednesday passed quietly in our neighborhood. However, the phone call was supposed to disrupt this harmony. I felt it. But being a responsible person, I still answered the call. It turned out to be Sherry, the wife of my wife's boss, Jack, who was in a state of panic. It turned out Jack had a heart attack while working with Tracy. My wife called an ambulance, and Jack was taken to the hospital in critical condition. Sherry asked me to take Tracy home since she intended to stay with Jack. I promised to go for her and wish Jack a speedy recovery. Jack had been my wife's boss for 22 years. She started working at his company right after college and became his indispensable assistant. Our family often spent time together with Jack's family. He always seemed like a pleasant person to me. My wife always praised him as a caring boss. Jack, originally from France, was 10 years older than Tracy and me, but still remained energetic and attractive for his age. He always drew attention with his charm. I believe everyone has their own destiny, but I was surprised to learn about Jack's heart attack. I parked the car at the ambulance bay, entered, and asked about his condition. I explained to the nurse that I was Tracy's husband and was looking for her. I overheard a conversation between two doctors, but didn't understand what they were talking about. I was just waiting for Tracy. A few minutes later, she came out with Sherry, and we hugged. He's gone, Rick, Tracy whispered, crying. The doctor said it was a heart attack. I was stunned, standing in the hallway, hugging both women, hearing their sobs. Sherry also lost her husband, they had been together for 35 years. They have a daughter, Amy, who is three years older than my daughter Allison, who is 18, and the girls are so similar they could be sisters. Jack treasured Amy. This will be very difficult for her, I thought to myself. Just then, one of the EMTs came up to me and asked if I was Tracy's husband. I said yes, and he handed me Tracy's purse, saying that she had left it in the ambulance when they arrived at the hospital. I separated myself from the crying women, taking the purse in my left hand, thanked him, and shook his right hand with mine. I then began wrapping the dangling strap around the purse to get it out of the way when I thought I saw a bra tucked into the middle compartment. It didn't make any sense to me, so I took another look, and sure enough, there was a bra in the purse. It was so crazy when the women left the room crying that I never got a good look at Tracy. I noticed that she was indeed not wearing a bra. This is weird, I thought to myself. I don't know how long we stayed in the hospital with Sherry before she decided she needed to leave. Amy was getting ready to return from university in the morning, and Sherry decided that she needed to get some sleep. I dropped Sherry off at her house and then drove Tracy and me to our house. I thought I could help both women get their cars tomorrow, Sherry from the emergency room lot and Tracy from the work lot. Tracy didn't say a word to me as we walked through the door, heading straight to the master bathroom and getting into the shower. She joined me in the living room about 20 minutes later, her eyes red and puffy from crying. She sat down on the couch, and I climbed out of my chair and joined her, pulling her towards me for a tight hug. She was breathing raggedly, and I could feel her body shaking with sobs. I wanted to ask her why she wasn't wearing a bra, given that she was supposed to be working with Jack, but I didn't have the guts to do it at that moment. Instead, I held her quietly for another 20 minutes until she said she was tired and was going to bed. It was midnight, so I decided to go to bed with her. The next morning, after showering and shaving, I offered to take Tracy to the office to pick up the car. 
She suddenly looked like she had been punched in the gut and began to stutter before taking a moment to catch her breath and calm down. Instead, she asked me to take her to Sherry's, and they would take a taxi to the office and pick up some of Jack's things. Tracy would then take Sherry to the hospital to fill out some paperwork and pick up Jack's personal belongings. I offered my help but was quickly rejected. This actually worked quite well for me. I needed to find the EMTs who worked last night and get some answers. After dropping Tracy off at Sherry's and getting a quick update on how she was doing, I headed back to the car and drove straight to the hospital. I quickly managed to find out the names of the emergency doctors who brought Jack in yesterday, and they told me where to find them. I found my targets on the fire escape where I was directed, and they remembered me from the night before. I looked at the person who handed me Tracy's purse, his name tag said his name was Rob, and I asked him point blank where the race started. What do you mean? He asked, suddenly looking at me with suspicion. My wife and Jack were supposed to be working, but you didn't take them to Sofitel, did you? Isn't that why you called me cook? Oh, Jesus, buddy, I didn't mean anything personal, he said, raising his voice. We've just seen enough of these cases where the two people checking into a room aren't husband and wife, and when the shit hits the fan, we're the bad guys. Don't shoot the damn messenger. Calm down, Rob. I'm not trying to blame you for anything. I'm just trying to get to the truth. I had to look up the meaning of cook and didn't like what I saw, but I don't think that's your problem. Obviously, it's my problem if you tell me you picked them up somewhere other than Sofitel. We picked them up at the West Seat Hotel, Rob answered. I think they were doing this for about 15 minutes when the guy just grabbed his chest and collapsed on top of your wife. She actually had to push him away from her to get to the phone and call 911, and then she gave him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. He was barely alive when we took him to the emergency room. I had the truth. I didn't need more. I thanked them both and left. I felt them looking at me with pity in their eyes as I left. While I was driving home, my head was spinning. Tracy was having intimate with Jack when he suffered a heart attack. I wonder how long this went on, I thought. Then it hit me, actually it hit me like a thunderbolt. Allison and their daughter Amy were not just a coincidence, they were sisters. Tracy have a night with him for at least 19 years. How could I not have noticed this before? What a gullible idiot I was. She and Jack worked late at least once a week, sometimes twice, and then had the occasional business trip or party. Was she really sleeping with him all this time? What about the business trips they took together? How could Sherry not know? I admit I can be an ignorant idiot sometimes, but how can a woman be so ignorant, especially when the girls look so much alike? And Sherry was in the office often, Tracy said popping in at any time just to say hello to her husband or her. I thought they were good friends from the way it looked. How could Tracy do this to Sherry? Tracy's car was in the garage when I got home. She was sitting in the living room, drinking wine from a glass when I entered. Apparently, the look on my face told her I was unhappy. What happened, dear? She asked. Although I wanted to act calmly, my anger took over and I could not control myself. How long did you have intimate with Jack? I blurted out, venom dripping from my voice as I turned up the volume. He's Allison's father, isn't he? Tracy dropped her wine glass as she jumped up from the couch. How? How? How could you tell me such terrible things? She screamed, practically attacking me. She stopped about a foot away from me, eyes blazing like lasers, and if looks could kill, I would have been dead on the spot. I wasn't going to back down. I was right, and I knew it. I stood my ground, looking intently into those eyes, but I lowered the volume almost to a whisper when I hissed. Tell me to kiss your fifth place, but don't you dare lie to me and tell me I'm wrong. I'll ram your teeth down your throat if you lie to me. Never before in the twenty years of our marriage and our relationship before this have I yelled at my wife. Let alone threatened to physically harm her. To say she was shocked would be an understatement. Her mouth opened as if she was about to lie, but then apparently she realized that I was serious and the lie stuck in her throat. She also quickly jumped away from me, maybe it was the flames coming out of my eyes. You killed him, you know. I told her as she sat back down on the sofa, ignoring the spilled wine on the carpet. The stress of the deception combined with the physical activity was probably too much for his heart. I'm surprised this didn't happen sooner, considering how long you two have been having intimate. 
From the stricken expression on her face, I knew I had struck a nerve. She looked down at her hands and fidgeted for what seemed like minutes, but in reality, it was probably only ten seconds. Oh my god, do you think I really killed him? She asked quietly. I wonder if Sherry thinks so too. Why would Sherry think that way unless she knew about you too? Did she know about you too? She knew and approved of it almost from the very beginning, Tracy said quietly. Sometimes she even joined us, especially when she went on business trips with us. She always told me that she thought it was right that I should enjoy Jack because I was such an important part of his success in business. And she was glad that I took care of him in the office while she took good care of him at home. It was my turn to sit down. I felt dizzy and confused. So, I was the only one who didn't know? What about Allison? Allison has known about this for the last four years. She handles it well, Tracy said. Oh, Allison knows, and she's good at it. God, howled. That's not really what I meant. Does Sherry know that Allison is Jack's daughter? Sherry knows, and she's okay with it. Amy knows too, Tracy revealed. Well, I guess you've all had a good laugh at stupid old Rick's expense many times. Even my daughter, his daughter, I suppose, knew and didn't tell me. Damn wonderful. I ran out of the house. I ended up going to a local park and just sat there for a couple of hours, staring into space. Tracy called my cell phone a couple of times, but I let the calls go to voicemail. I just sat and thought. I always considered myself a smart guy, but when it came to Tracy, I was a complete dumbass. It never occurred to me that she was cheating on me, and I trusted her so completely that I probably missed a bunch of semi-obvious signs. At least for 19 years. So damn ignorant. I wondered if there was anyone else besides Jack. A whirlwind of thoughts raged in my brain. I left the park when it started to get dark and drove home. When I entered the house from the garage, I saw Tracy sitting in her usual place with a cup of tea in front of her. She offered me a cup, but I declined and went to my wine cabinet for something stronger. I poured myself a glass of whiskey and sat down in the chair opposite her. I can't even begin to tell you how sorry I am for hurting you, Tracy said quietly, looking at her hands. I need to know the whole story now, I said, and there was more than a little irritation in my voice. You have to tell me how you could do this to me while saying you love me. You have to tell me if you ever really loved me and if you respected me. Don't you dare doubt my love for you, never, Tracy shouted with urgency in her voice. I always loved you. I still love you. I just love Jack. Some people think that you can only love one person, but I know that is not true because I have love too. Don't spare me, continue, I said decisively. Tracy joined Sofitel when the company was about a year old. As in many small companies, employees worked long hours and became emotionally close. It was an exciting time for her, and I remembered her telling me about the difficulties during our dates. We dated for about a year when she joined the company. As the company became successful and grew, Tracy became Jack's right-hand woman, so to speak. He was a dynamic leader in the face of the company. She was essentially the glue that held everything together. She excelled at many tasks, and Jack came to depend on her as his other half. At the same time that things were heating up between Tracy and I outside the office, things were heating up between Jack and Tracy in the office. She noted that it was almost as if her personal and work lives were in parallel. Although Tracy and Jack were respectable in front of the rest of the office, she continued, away from the others, they became even more affectionate. Discussing everything from soup to nuts, from intim to politics. She was 24 years old, beautiful with an athletic build and long blonde hair. He was 34 years old, a well-built man with long wavy brown hair, a sweet smile, and an almost old-fashioned politeness. Tracy remembered how it had felt almost natural the first time they had made love on the leather couch in his office at the end of a long day because it seemed so natural. Tracy said she never felt guilty about sleeping with both me and Jack, even when we got married a year later. It wasn't lust. It was a complete love affair, similar but at the same time different from the one she and I had. But she knew she could never tell me because of how I felt about infidelity. She loved us both and wanted it to continue. Although I was not told about the affair, Jack told Sherry about two months later when he and Tracy realized their romance would be long-lasting. 
he wanted to be completely honest with his wife, who had just given birth to their first child. Sherry and Amy will always have the biggest place in his heart, Tracy said. Jack told Sherry, but he wanted to keep a piece of his heart for Tracy. Then Sherry invited Tracy to spend the weekend with Jack and her. I remembered how she went away for the weekend under the pretext of her mother's illness, and after that weekend, she gave her blessing to the affair. When Tracy became pregnant several years later, it was Sherry who took the troubled Tracy into her heart. And it was she who decided how the narrative would unfold if the baby was indeed Jack's. Since Jack and I both had a plus blood, that solved the easy part. And since I was almost never around both girls together alone, when someone noticed the girls' similarities, Sherry or Tracy almost always made some witty remark. Both women knew that if I had a chance to think about it, I might become suspicious. Sherry looked at Tracy almost like a little sister and was actually proud of Jacques' second family, Tracy noted. I sat dumbfounded during Tracy's confession, no memory, actually, as she in no way expressed regret for what she had done, she was simply recalling the events. Tracy paused and looked at me as if she expected me to say something. The only thing I could think of at that moment was to ask if he and Jack took a break when we first got married and had intimate almost every day of the week. She looked confused and looked away before finally answering, No, it was such an exciting time in my life. I had two handsome men loving me and wanting me, and I was extremely horny all the time, she said. In those days when Jax and I made love, I always tried hard to wash myself down there in case we were going to have a night too. Yes, sometimes you had sloppy seconds, but I tried to keep them to a minimum, and I never allowed you to caress my private part after Jack and I made love. Terribly tactful of you, I muttered. The funny thing is, after all these years, I never really compared the two of you intimate, she continued. You were both good lovers, kind and considerate, and about the same height. It wasn't the best intimate with Jack, just different because of who each of you is. I have to admit I was somewhat comforted by the fact that it wasn't just lust with a big dorky stranger, but at the same time. I was stung to the core by her confession that she loved him as much as she loved me. I was raised to believe in one partner, one soulmate for each of us, and while I may have been the one receiving most of her intimacy, there was another one I was sharing with. Tracy sat down her tea and looked into my eyes, trying to look into my soul. I had no answer to her unasked question, and I had no words of wisdom. I put the bottle in the closet, put the glass in the sink, and headed upstairs to bed. I knew without a doubt that I would not be able to sleep that night. Tracy came to the bed after about five minutes and lay down, curled up behind me. I pretended to be asleep so I wouldn't even have to say goodnight to her. I got up at my usual 5 a.m., did my morning routine, and headed to work. Tracy was still in bed when I left, which meant she had no plans to go to Sofitel. I guess she and Sherry will need to figure out what's next now that Jack is gone. This is their problem. Obviously, I needed to deal with my own problem. Work had always been a source of solace for me when things weren't going well in my life, and I hoped that trend would continue. I work for Mayoni Pharmaceuticals, where I am the vice president of sales. Even though I am 45 years old, I belong to a new breed in this industry. I'm a chemist by training, so unlike most sales guys in my industry, I actually know how products are made and what exactly they do. I was even involved in the creation of one of our products, a pill that helps reduce female libido for those who are overly horny. It was a great product for us, and I made a good profit from it for myself. I also make a very good salary, and with Tracy's salary, we were doing very well, upscale house in a trendy area, two nice cars, great vacation. Neither of us will suffer financially when we divorce, well, that's what I thought about the dreaded or word. I didn't think about it until now, probably because it was cloudiness in my mind from the moment I found out Tracy was cheating. Since Allison was in college and moved away from home, there's really no reason for us to stay together other than the fact that Tracy ripped my heart out. There shouldn't be anything special about it. My boss, Arnold Kramer, and I have worked together for 18 years after 5 years of working as a chemist for another pharmaceutical company. I met Ari at an industry convention, and we talked about a lot of things. It was he who suggested that I should try my hand at sales and then offered me a place in his company. I liked the idea and went to work for him. Ari was 100% correct in his assessment of my skills, and we both benefited greatly from it. 
Not only do we work well together, but he turns out to be a damn nice guy, and we developed what I hope is a close lifelong friendship. Ari has been married to his wife Lauren for nearly 30 years. He has two grown children and four, no, five grandchildren. He's 52 but acts like he's 30, lots of energy, sharp as a tack. And not only is he smart, but he's not afraid to hire other smart people. I'd like to think I'm one of them. Ari seemed crushed when I told him that Tracy cheated on me and I was going to divorce her. He asked me if I was sure she really cheated, and I said yes. He didn't press for details, and I didn't say anything. We would talk in due time, and he knew it. Nevertheless, he reached into his file cabinet and pulled out a card from the law firm representing the company. Ari is incredibly loyal to people who do good work for him, and he trusted the guys in this company who had a small divorce division. He told me to take whatever time I needed, but I assured him that I would only need to spend a few hours here and there. It should be a simple matter, after all. I noted we lived in a no-fault state. We both wanted to do right by Allison, and we both had our own retirement accounts that we could each keep. We could split the proceeds for the house. God, I missed this one by a mile. When I got home from work that evening, Tracy was dressed for the occasion. Dinner was on the table, my favorite supreme spaghetti, and she had opened a nice bottle of Merlot. Everything looked so good that I didn't have the heart to remind her that it was Jack who was a wine aficionado and that I like my spirits distilled. I think under pressure, it's hard to remember everything about both of your husbands. Tracy was her usual chatty self while we ate, acting as if nothing had changed between us. I waited about 10 minutes before ending the charade by finally using those famous four words that no spouse ever wants to hear, we need to talk. No, we don't need that, she practically snapped at me. I have to admit I was shocked by her answer and her tone. I caught up with her, and she admitted that she had been having a years-long affair with her boss. She knew how I felt about infidelity, how could she think that I would keep her? I was hoping we could at least talk like civilized adults before I serve you, I told her as calmly as I could. You can do whatever you like to get me served, but I won't give you a divorce, she said, with more than a hint of irritation in her voice. The point is that you love me, and I love you, and I won't let you go. I will fight this every step of the way. You're being stupid, and you're going to ruin the best thing you've ever had all because your pride is hurt, I started to answer, but she interrupted me. Until you found out about Jack and me, did I ever give you any reason to doubt my love for you? Have I ever neglected you in any way? You absolutely got as much good intimate as you wanted, and I took care of you in every way, physically, mentally, emotionally. Are we each other's best friends? If you had not known this by this unfortunate accident, you would have gone to your grave loving me completely. Until your last breath, you would never understand anything. Can't we just get back to this? No, because I found out. You don't love me as much as you say because otherwise, you couldn't give yourself to another man, both in soul and body. You knew it was wrong, so you hid it from me. I don't call two decades of deception love. It's bad enough that you have a night with another man for two decades, but you tell me that you love him, you were close to him just like you were close to me. What kind of love is this? Forget about Intim for a moment. Can't you see that every ounce of love you gave him, you stole from me? I had more than enough love for you too, Tracy shouted back at me. He was man enough to understand this, but I spared you, so I never told you about it, and now you're proving that I was right, courageous enough. Was I not man enough because I wouldn't let you have a bed partner and a half-husband on the side? This is absolute crap. I wasn't stupid enough to let you do this to me voluntarily, so you made the decision yourself, for yourself, completely for yourself. It was all about what you wanted and got, and believe me, I have no doubt that if I had not found out about this, I would have gone to my grave a completely happy man and the biggest idiot in the world. And you could just write this on my tombstone, here lies Rick Avondale. The luckiest fool in the world, he thought life was wonderful because he had no idea that his wife had two husbands. The service and funeral took place three days later, on Monday. I was not present. I got up like any other morning and went to work. When I got home, Tracy and Allison were in the kitchen, still wearing the morning clothes they wore to the funeral. I walked up to my daughter, who was home from college, and tried to hug her. After all, she had not been home for about two months, I said, 
trying because the hug never materialized. At first, she recoiled from my touch, then she turned her back to me and walked away quietly crying. Tracy put her hand on my forearm and shook her head gently. Under normal circumstances, I would have taken the hint and left it as is, but these were no longer normal circumstances. I literally growled. I went upstairs to the bedroom, grabbed enough clothes to last me a few days, grabbed my toothbrush and toiletries, and left. Tracy started blowing up my phone almost the minute I walked out. I allowed all calls to go to voicemail. However, I had to give Allison credit for one thing. Unlike her mother, she didn't pretend that everything would be fine. At some point, she decided that I was the in this play, and she was going to make me pay. Well, if she was going to make me pay by ripping my heart out, she had accomplished her mission. Not only was she not my child biologically, but she just made it abundantly clear that she was no longer my child emotionally. It just got worse by the minute. On Tuesday, I took advantage of my free time, went to the bank, and divided all the bills into hers and mine. I closed our credit cards, opened a new one in my name only, and made an appointment with the law office Ari recommended. They squeezed me in on Thursday. I hadn't slept for three days when I went to see my lawyer on Thursday. I swear to God, but his name was Mike Squishy. I hoped he was a much better lawyer than his name suggested. I thought there wasn't really much to discuss. I explained the matter to him in detail and said that I wanted to separate from my wife as soon as possible. I also told him that I wanted Jax's estate to be sued for alimony. Well, if Allison was no longer my child in any sense of the word, then let her real father pay for her upbringing. I'm tired of being a fool, I told Mike. Mike said he didn't see any problem with it, but if Tracy was really adamant about not getting a divorce, the judge might order mandatory counseling, which could take a while. I told him to go for it, and on Monday the following week, Tracy was handed the papers at Soulful. I'm guessing she was served at 10.07 a.m. because at 10.08, our receptionist said an irate Tracy was on line 93 for a week. I did not answer any of Tracy's calls or messages on my cell phone, and I instructed the secretary to send her calls directly to my voicemail, which they did. But I knew I couldn't avoid her forever. So one day, I told Marlene, our senior secretary, to put her through to me when she called. You are an incredible, I hung up as soon as she finished her first curse. Phone call number two came in 15 seconds later. Don't you dare hang this. I hung up again, wondering how long it would take for her to realize that she had to be polite if she wanted to talk to me. Phone call number three took a little longer. When I answered, she practically whispered that she was trying so hard to control herself. You won the first round. We need to talk, she said. This is just wonderful, I said as cheerfully as I could. Call my lawyer, Mike Squishy, at the number I'll send you and make an appointment with us. You may also want to bring your own lawyer with you, this could speed up the process. The meeting was scheduled for two weeks later. Until then, I continued to live in a nearby motel, stopping by my old house to cut the grass and occasionally picking up mail and other belongings. When Tracy first saw me drive up to the house, she tried to greet me like I was her long-lost husband and started hugging me in the driveway. But I physically pushed her away from me and walked into the house. You didn't have to tell the world about our problems right there in the driveway, did you? She said. Hey, if I'm such an, divorce me, I replied calmly. The meeting with the lawyers took place on Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock. As always, a gentleman, I let Tracy make her case first, that she loved me completely and was simply leaving a little room in her heart for Jax. And of course, now that he was dead, everything would be mine all the time. Are you ready to throw away 20 wonderful years because of this? She asked me. Did our love mean so little to you? No, it is precisely because our love meant so much to me that we must dissolve this marriage, I answered. You completely captured my heart and Vel deceived me to get it. How can I not see this as a complete betrayal of trust, the very foundation of marriage? You knew what you were doing was wrong, so you betrayed my trust to get exactly what you wanted, both of us physically and emotionally but he knew and accepted it, and I was tricked into it. For some reason, no one offered me to have intimate with his wife. This divorce is not on my conscience, it's about your selfishness and betrayal. I would never accept sharing you physically with another man, but sharing your love with another man is not everything. 
It hurts worse than if you just had a cheap, tawdry affair with a hot stud. You loved this guy and had intimate with this guy and even had a child with him. Just because I didn't know didn't fix the situation. You both stole from me. It's a good thing he died of a heart attack that day because if he hadn't, I would have shot him, Tracy gasped as I made my final statement. I was already in tears. You know, in all this time, you have never said that you regret cheating on me, I continued. You apologize for hurting me, and I know you're sorry you got caught, but I don't think you're the least bit sorry for what you did, Rick. I know you can do your part, don't go through this divorce, she said. My part? This was our marriage, Tracy. There wasn't supposed to be my part and your part, it was supposed to be just us forever. Mike looked at Tracy's lawyer and said, I think we're done here, your client must sign the documents and return them to us. Attorney Tracy, a stern, middle-aged African-American woman, nodded grimly and held out her hand for Mike to shake. Over the next two weeks, some minor details were sorted out, and about three months after that, we were officially divorced. Two days after the divorce became official, I had Mike file a lawsuit against Jacques' estate for what was essentially child support and college expenses, although it sounded better when Mike used legalese. I probably wouldn't have done this if Allison hadn't made it clear to me after the funeral that she wanted nothing more to do with me. I raised this child as my own for 18 years, and this was the respect I was given. But I think she had four years to think about it after Tracy brought her up to speed, and in her eyes, I was no better than a fool. So, 14 years of complete fatherly love went down the drain. So, no, I wasn't offended at all when Mike suggested replacing lost respect with real dollars, one million, to be exact. I liked Mike's attitude. I was awaiting a call from Sherry when she was served, but instead, I received a call from Tracy. Sherry probably thought I would be more accepting of Tracy's message, even though she was wrong. Was this just another way to get back at me? Are you suffering because of money, Tracy? Asked when I answered the phone. Well, hello to you too, Mrs. Avondale. It's so nice of you to call. It's not that I don't know why she's calling, you realize this makes you look like a complete, right? She commented. Do you realize that I raised and spent my resources on another man's child for 18 years while you, Sherry, and Jack had a good laugh at my expense? And this other man's child now thinks I'm nothing more than a dumbass, I don't give a damn what any of you think, I hung up without saying goodbye. I guess Tracy expressed to Sherry my position and what a stubborn, I can be when I'm right about something because after her LW tried to bargain with Mike. She just wrote me a check for a million. And as it turned out, a couple of months later, Sherry could easily afford that million because she sold Sofitel to a Japanese company for eight million. Since Jack was no longer there to run things, this was probably a good business move. The story probably should have ended there, but as old reporter Paul Harvey used to say, now for the rest of the story. Two days after the sale of Sofitel, two million was transferred into my account in the Cayman Islands. This was my fee for helping Nakatomi LTD obtain Sofitel. Within nine months after Nakatomi's anonymous lawyer and I signed a deal stating that no matter how it happened or what role I'll play in this actually. If Nakatomi acquired Sofitel by a certain date, I would get paid for it. If the acquisition does not take place by that date, the deal would be terminated. So right now, you're probably wondering what role I played in the Sofitel deal. It's a little complicated but the point is that I wasn't entirely honest with you earlier in the story. Most of the story was based on truth, but some of it was based on what could have been an Academy Award-winning movie directed by me, a guy who seemed completely clueless. Let me explain. In fact, I was an ignorant man for about a month before Jack died. Then I was approached by a lawyer from Nakatomi LTD who wanted me to help him close a deal with Jack's for Sofitel. Why do you need my help besides the fact that my wife is Jack's right hand? I asked innocently enough. Because we know you're smart, and we think you'll rise to the challenge and get rewarded for outsmarting the who's been cuckolding you behind your back for years, the lawyer said. To say I was shocked would be an understatement. Tracy cheated on me, and this guy from Japan knew about it. Are you kidding me? It turns out that Nakatomi LTD has been investigated by several companies, and when these guys do their research, they do everything except examine body cavities. They easily learned about Jack and Tracy and how Sherry and both daughters fit into the story. 
they rightly believed that I would be more than willing to do everything in my power to help them. But it had to be done quickly because they were looking at several other software firms, and I had to complete the order within nine months. However, first, they showed me their evidence of Tracy's infidelity. They had photos, videos, phone calls, travel receipts, everything. I had everything in my hands to bury the two of them. And then they motivated me. I make a very good salary, and I didn't necessarily need the money, but they offered me $2 million to help them take the company away from Jack. Hell, I would have helped them for free at that point, but I wasn't going to tell them that. I just had to figure out my plan of action. And I had to make sure that the money would come to me after the divorce so that I wouldn't have to split it since we live in a no-fault state. But first, I needed to calm down so as not to give myself away. My honest first thought was to wait until the next date and storm in and shoot them both. But I didn't like being Bubba's cellmate for the rest of my life, so I had to play it cool and keep acting like I don't know. Something I've been doing for 20 years. So who cares if I play along a little longer? I told Ari that I found out about Tracy and Jack's affair, but I didn't tell him how I found out. One day, we stayed up late with a bottle of Don Julio tequila, throwing out ideas about what I should do. Finally, after drinking about half the bottle, he looked at me seriously and said, Damn it, son, isn't it just crap that the guy who invented Kid All puts up with his wife getting by another man? You should have slipped her some of this, Rick. That's when the light bulb went on. Although I didn't tell Ari for obvious reasons, not for her, I thought to myself. I had to slip this some of this stuff. Hey, wait a minute, you can kill two birds with one stone. One of the really good things about Cockerel is that, unlike most other medications, it doesn't have many contraindications. In fact, there's only one, this pill should not be taken by men at all because, although it calms the female libido, for some reason, it causes a spike in blood pressure in men and can lead to a fatal heart attack. I just needed to give some of the pill to Jack. Jack and I both belong to the same golf course, and we sometimes play together with two other guys. I arranged for the four of us to play the following Saturday with a stop at a restaurant for a nice lunch. After the first nine holes, which were good, and we had about 90 minutes for lunch and drinks before our second nine, I looked at Jack and casually asked, Hey buddy, are you okay? You look a little exhausted. The other two guys and I were about 10 years younger than Jack, and he knew it, so yeah, the question had a slightly depressing effect on him. I could see the wheels turning in his head. No. I'm just a little tired, but we don't need to move anything for me. I'm fine, he replied. I actually didn't think he looked tired at all, but now I was playing on his insecurities about being the oldest guy in the group. I've got just what you need, buddy, I said. Pulling a small bag of unmarked white pills from my front left pants pocket, something I keep just for myself and drink every day with lunch. Helps me get through the rest of the day with ease. I handed Jack a bag of five tablets. Take these for the next few days, and if you like them, I'll bring you more the next time we meet to play. Jack took one tablet out of the bag, popped it into his mouth, and washed it down with bourbon and ice. He beat his chest like a monkey and let out a Tarzan scream. Let's go, guys. I'm as cheerful as ever, he shouted cheerfully. In fact, for a few minutes, he probably actually felt energized. Higher blood pressure pumps you up a little, which is why athletes take heart pills to dope but too much of a good thing, and for those wondering why I gave him a small baggie rather than a bottle of pills or a box of pills, the reason is that when he's done taking the pills, he'll just throw the bag away rather than keeping it where it won't be found in his pocket in case someone was rummaging through his clothes. When the inevitable happened Wednesday night, for those paying attention, now these five tablets will last until Wednesday, which was a typical night for the Jack Try Love Festival. Combine a man's blood pressure, which is already elevated from having intim with a beautiful woman rather than his wife. With medications that cause his blood pressure to rise and spike, and you have a heart attack, most likely fatal. But since it looked like a normal heart attack, and since we live in a small town without a large homicide unit, the only way to investigate it is if something looks suspicious or out of place. So, I tried to play my role as the new cuckold to the best of my ability acting exactly as I had done when I found out about the affair a month earlier. I have to say I was even impressed with my acting talents. Two days after the money arrived in my account and was immediately transferred to another account, 
I invited Ari and his wife to a large, luxurious dinner. Ostensibly to thank Ari for being a great boss and supporting me in my time of need. He didn't need to know that it was actually to sow the seeds of my revenge. With Jack gone from both women's lives, the bond between Tracy and Sherry weakened significantly. Especially when Sherry had time to think about the fact that Jack died practically on Tracy. I was also told that Tracy's failure to convince me to drop my claim against the estate for child support made Sherry very angry. Although I don't think she realized that Tracy wasn't getting any of that money because at that moment, we were already divorced. Sherry fired Tracy shortly after she paid me, and the guys at Nakatomi LTD apparently spread a rumor in their world about an affair between Jack and Tracy. Effectively ending Tracy's career in business administration. It's probably not very good when the boss dies in bed with you, or rather, on you. Don't cry too much for Tracy, though. She won't be standing in line for bread for a while, and she will be able to help her daughter. Yes, I said to her daughter. Allison made it very clear to me that after Jack died, she no longer wanted anything to do with me, turning me down not only once, but several times. I guess that's what I get for raising her, providing for her, coaching her soccer team, and going to all her dance recitals. Well, I think I won't repeat this mistake again. I guess I'm doing pretty well for a guy who lost the love of his life after 20 years. It took me a while, but eventually, I started dating again. I'm just not sure I'll ever be able to fully trust a woman again, and I'm not sure I'll ever be able to find one that matches what I thought I had with Tracy. But let's not forget that I'm worth about 5 million, so I retired and now only work on special projects for my own. Maybe one day, I'll invent a pill that will allow ignorant husbands to spot a cheating wife right away. This would really benefit humanity. What do you think of our story today? I thought the husband went a little overboard with his decision to drug her lover. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. See you in the next videos.